Mm -hmm. Probably a road. Uh, it could well be, yeah. yeah is that recycled stuff? Or? Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so with pavement materials, you'll, you'll hear um, a few different terms thrown around. Firstly, there's the unbound granular materials, and they're your typical crushed rocks, or your crushed limestone, or your natural gravels, or whatever they are. We then have what we call a modified granular material. And a modified granular material is characterised exactly the same as an unbound granular material. <coughs> they may have a small amount of cement, or a small amount of another pozzolanic material, or any other material, <coughs> just to improve the properties of it and bring it up to what uh, a, a, an unbound granular material property should be. But they're not bound, and they're not, not, a, not designed to be bound. Up, up north you get quite a bit of that where you'll have a perfect base course material but the fines, you've got say, I don't know, 8% fines and they're just really high PI yep. and that, that makes it unsuitable because my understanding is usually just to get the PI down, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It could be to get the PI down, yeah. uh, improve moisture sensitivity, yeah. um, which is what the purpose of the HCC, HCTCRB was, was to improve its moisture sensitivity. Mm. Um, it could be to improve its modulus. Okay. Yeah. Um, then there might be several reasons you might uh, modify it. And usually there's a max UCS, like it has to be less than one MPA or something like that? Or, yeah, or something we'll get on to that because that's a bit interesting. Um, bound granular materials, that's where you do develop tensile stress or tensile <coughs> capabilities in the material. So um, bitumen stabilised materials, um, or cement stabilised materials with a higher proportion of cement um, are bound, but they're still considered a flexible paper. Asphalt is a bound material but flexible, and concrete is a different one because that's actually classed as rigid, so it doesn't flex very much at all. <laughs> the design methods that we have. Um, we have an empirical chart, which is figure 8.4 of Ostroids, which, you know, just about everyone knows that figure. That is suitable for any granular material or modified granular materials, with or without a thin bituminous surfacing. So you can use that chart for an, a gravel road, for an unsealed road, and you can use it for, for <coughs> asphalt thicknesses up to about 40 mil. Once you start to get a lot beyond 40 mil, you're starting to induce um, tensile strains in the asphalt itself. It's not just a wearing course, it's starting to become a, a, a significant player in the pavement strength, and that requires some special considerations, which we'll, we'll discuss in the pavement design. Mechanistic pavement design can be used for anything. So you can do granular pavements with a um, mechanistic design, but what Lee Wardle, who wrote Circular, does say is that for anything less than 50 millimetres of asphalt, don't consider it reliable for any strains that it generates in the asphalt layer, so ignore them, basically. And there's a rich, separate rigid method for concrete. So unbound granular and modified materials are both exactly, pretty much exactly the same. You've got all these different material types. It can be a manufactured material like crushed rock, it can be partially manufactured like limestone, where it's partially crushed but very poorly graded, or it could be a natural gravel. The important thing is that they develop their shear strength through particle interlock and they don't have any tensile strength. And the way they'll fail is either through shear or densification. So if you don't con compact them sufficiently, you'll get rutting, which is densification. If you get shoving, which is often referred to as rutting, 
but it is a different failure mode, you can share the material. And eventually, so the, the theory goes, they will disintegrate through mechanical breakdown and abrasion over decades. That can take a long, long time, particularly in residential streets, so never. <laughs> um, so, if you're doing mechanistic design, you need a modulus value for these materials, a Poisson's ratio, and a degree of, and I, sticking that and in front of isotropy makes it rather difficult to say, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Um, <coughs> the performance criteria are that it meets the specification, that's all there is. In the Austrade's method, for these materials there is no performance relationship, which is interesting because <coughs> you can determine on the performance um, characteristics of the asphalt, you can f f determine what the performance of the subgrade is for a performance relationship, but there is no relationship for the unbound granular materials, which is a pretty big weakness, I believe, in the, in the methodology. A modified granular material has exactly the same principles, but it may be modified with a bit of bitumen or <coughs> chemicals or cement or lime or slag lime or fly ash or granulated glass burner slag or any of those type of materials. But again, there's no performance relationship. When we come to cemented materials, um, and these are where they get beyond a certain MPA value, which I'll discuss a bit later, these can be achieved by lime, cement, other pozzolans, um, or bitumen. Um, these develop their strength not only through particle interlock but through the chemical bonding which holds them together. So now we've got tensile strength. Their distress mode can be erosion and pumping. It can also be through um, fatigue. <coughs> it's unlikely you'll get um, uh, shear failure or rutting in these materials. Generally it'll either be fatigue or pumping. The input parameters here, we definitely need the modulus again and the Poisson's ratio and now there is a fatigue relationship um, and that's given in austrades and when you do circular relationships you need to put those fatigue characteristics into the circular program and when we get around to running a circular program we'll show you how that's done. <coughs> Heavy bitumen stabilised, um, these can be emulsion and cement, um, I use a couple of different methods, emulsion cement is a one I'm using with a pretty good deal of success and foam bitumen um, with or without lime or cement but it, there, there is a little bit of difference in the performance of them with or without lime and, or cement um, uh, cement will give it a high early strength much higher earlier strength as will a high proportion of lime but it increases the risk of block cracking further down the track so if you don't want any cracking with foam bitumen, keep your line percentages down or your cement below. Um, we used to use lime, quick lime. Um, the trouble is in metropolitan areas, if anyone's ever walked through quick lime and thongs <coughs> and sweaty feet, you'll know what it does to your feet uh, or, or dogs or anything like that that runs through it. It's a pretty nasty material. And uh, you get it down your throat, you know all about it. It's a nasty material, so we've actually changed over to cement because it's a safer material to work with. This will, and, th and this is a, a big debate we have at the moment with bitumen stabilised materials. Ostroids, which is primarily at the moment, Ostroids is driven by 
Department of Transport and Main Roads Queensland, TNR Queensland. And the guys there are insisting that it's a fatigue performance. Um, if you listen to the South Africans who have got a huge amount more experience in this than us, and someone like Kim Jenkins, I don't know if you've heard of Kim Jenkins, but he's very big in this field, he will insist that it can't be failed by fatigue, it can only fail by sheer. So there's this big argument um, going on between the states. Austroads is currently developing a performance relationship um, based on fatigue. Um, I believe they're going the wrong way. That's my personal opinion. Um, I'm more comfortable with the South African method, um, which is not designing for fatigue. Uh, at the moment, the best um, method I've got is a wild guess. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just designing by recipe. I'm dropping the uh, thickness and I'm dropping the uh, bitumen content all the time. It still seems to be working extremely well. Started off at 4% bitumen down to 2.5% now. Um, I've built um, a section in Qdale Road, deliberately designed to fail after 12 months and now six years old and still going strong and not a sign of problem. So um, um, I'm feeding all this through to Austroids or Arb who's doing this <coughs> relationship saying this is what's happening and it's not failing for by fatigue and uh, they won't listen. When you think the uh, like BP now, I mean it's in their favour to get more bitumen stabilised pavements out, are they going to sell more bitumen? It is. Are they uh, pushing the barrow? Well, one, one of the problems you have is that there's a cost benefit. Yeah. Um, when we started this off, bitumen was about $630 a tonne. Yeah. Um, a year ago it was $1,250 a tonne. And it was getting to a stage where it just wasn't an economic process, yeah. unless you drop the bitumen content. Currently it's dropped down to $850 a tonne. Okay. So <coughs> it, for the stabilisation companies, it's better for the bitumen content to be down because it makes the process more economic. Uh, it's not good for the bitumen companies, <coughs> but in, in another way it is, because if, if a project, if a process is economic, and it's likely to be used, so they will sell the bitumen, so they're probably better off selling 2.5% bitumen than 4% bitumen that never gets done, because yeah. you can't afford to do it. Um, so, with asphalt, um, Cohesion is, a, uh, is an important part of the asphalt, so it's got sheer strength and cohesion, both of them. It has significant tensile strength, but bitumen is a, uh, uh, is a strange product because it's got properties aren't consistent. Asphalt properties vary according to temperature and the rate of loading. So if you've got a slow moving traffic, then your modulus values will be a lot less than if it's fast moving traffic. Um, if you've got high temperatures, the modulus is a lot less than it is for low temperatures. High temperatures, it's likely to fail by shear. Low temperatures, it's likely to fail by she uh, fatigue. So there's a lot of um, dilemma with, with asphalt pavements. The Distress mode is either fatigue or permanent deformation, which is shear or rutting. And I make the differentiation between shear and rutting because rutting is basically densification. And rutting is generally relatively insignificant on a thin layer of asphalt because you've only got you know, 40 mil and if it ruts a couple of mils, it's not a major issue. But if it shears, then it is a major issue. However, whilst we've got performance relationship for fatigue, we haven't got any performance relationships for rutting or shear. So 
So the only performance criteria we've got for rutting or shear is to meet the specification. And the specification is empirically based. You know, we've found over the years that if you have this sort of mix with this sort of uh, uh, bitumen content and this sort of grading, then it's not likely to run. Concrete, um, it will fatigue um, or it will have erosion from the sub base. They're the major um, fatigue or failure criteria, there's a lot in, in concrete roads um, and a, a lot of the working concrete ro roads re revolves around where you're going to put your joints <coughs> and if you read the RTA manual there's probably about two pages on actual thickness design and 30 pages on layer of cracks and where to put your joints. Uh, I don't know whether we'll have time to go through concrete or not. Granular material specifications, and this is an important thing, are empirical. Basically what's been found is that certain materials, and this is particularly applicable to any natural materials like gravels, they have found over a period of time that that particular gravel works. What properties did that gravel have? They go through the particle size distribution, the atterberg limits. Um, and they said, well, you know, that's what works, therefore that's the specification. With granular materials like crushed rock, there's a little bit more science in it, but it's still basically the same. And certainly with limestone, it's the same too. This limestone works. Why the friggin' hell it works when it's such a poorly graded, useless looking material? Who knows, but it works. So one of the important things you've got to remember is don't take a gravel and apply a crushed rock specification to it. Crushed rock specifications of a crushed rock, gravel specifications of a gravel, limestone specifications of a limestone, and so on. Do you sometimes feel like uh, we've had experiences where you, you, you're looking at materials and you know, you've got the grading, you've got the PI, you've got all those other little ratios they do, and all that's perfect. But then, for some reason, the CBR comes out low, and you just feel like, I don't believe the CBR. Sometimes I feel like the CBR actually almost shouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the CBR can vary widely. Mm. But what I can tell you is that <clears throat> there's two quarries in the Darling Range, mm -hmm. very close to each other, Holson and Borrell. And wholesome road base is a heap better than borrow road base. Mm. And yet you go through all the specification and you cannot pick a reason why but borrow road base is more sense moisture sensitive than wholesome. And yet particle size distribution, the same. Mm. Non-plastic, both of them. <coughs> and yet the wholesome material is better than the borrow. Mm. Um, so, yes, there is a CBR value. Um, again, that CBR value, we need to know what the conditions under which that CBR test was done. Obviously, for a base course, the surcharge is very low, so the 4.5 kilos is probably applicable, because all you're going to have over the top of it is asphalt. Um, but the other thing about these materials is that they are stress dependent. So the thinner the asphalt at the top of the granular layer, the higher the modulus that material will develop. The th as that asphalt thickens, you need to apply a lesser and lesser modulus value to that same material because it's not under the same stress. Um, so the Poisson's ratio, it stays the same, but the modulus value will vary. Um, yeah, and the modulus yeah, is defined by a vertical and confining stress, so <coughs> you need to know what those conditions are. So certainly the performance of granular materials does depend on the, somewhat on the particle size distribution. Um, 
but certainly a, a lot on the, uh, the uniformity of the material, what the strength of the individual particles are. Um, you know, there was a quarry producing road base out um, Meckering Way, and that had a very, very high LA test. You know, it was a granite, but very, very friable. Uh, didn't produce a good road base at all, so you know certainly that stone hardness is important. Um, the Atterberg limits, um, interesting uh, about the Atterberg limits, you'll get some consultants will consider that you do need a degree of plasticity to give it some cohesion, which is probably relevant if you're going to put a spray seal on to have a little bit of cohesion because it gives you a better surface for a spray seal. Um, but there's others um, who were adamant that why would you put shitty clay into a good quality crushed rock? <laughs> it's basically, and that, that's Russell Clay, you know Russell? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he's very adamant about that. Refuses to have any PI on a road base. Um, I've found that the road bases with PI are far more moisture sensitive than those without any PI. Um, particle size distribution to design um, a particular crushed rock use this Fuller's equation you've seen that I guess mm -hmm. Fuller's equation um, which relates the individual particle size that you're targeting on your um, <coughs> your sieve um, according to the maximum aggregate size so that's Fuller's equation there and there's an example of how it's run, so um, you can go through that later on. It's not important which way we go for time. We get a bit late, and I'm through 12 slides out of 56. So I'm not sure how long you guys want to go for. You want to keep going, or you have a cup full for the night? Seven. Seven. Three. What time you want to go to? Do another half hour? Yeah, probably another half hour. Okay, we'll go for another half and then call it quick. The particle shape um, is important. The... Where do I go on the way? Clearly you've run out of quick <laughs> <laughs> um, The particles, ideally, the more cubic the particles, the better. Um, there's a thing called the flakiness index, and that's a ratio of the length of the particle to the thickness. Um, and we want to keep that within limits. Um, so each specification you will find that there is a limit to the part B flakiness index. Um, rounded particles definitely have lower friction, that stands to reason. And the more flaky particles you get, um, the lower the modulus will be. So Cubic particles give you higher modulus values than flaky. Um, obviously excessive fines will reduce that into particle friction, particularly if they're plastic fines. And they have the effect on permeability as well. So a lot of fines, very fine particles, will reduce your permeability and also increase your moisture sensitivity. Atterberg limits, you all know what that is, so I'm not going to harp on that. Hardness and soundness of source rock, you'd all be familiar with those tests. The Los Angeles abrasion, micro devour, compressive strength, they're all pretty standards. Permeability, you know what that's determined on in mean, geotechnical engineering, so there wouldn't be anything new there. Um, but this pore pressure is an important thing to know. Um, we had um, uh, a situation in Canning where we had a, a road failure very quickly after construction within the first 12 months and it was due to pore pressure and what happened there, the primer seal that we put on was too coarse and when we put the asphalt over the top it left small voids now asphalt's not impermeable, moisture gets through the, the, um, the asphalt in small amounts, 
but when that moisture collects in those voids and you get the tyre pressure running over, particularly if the truck tyre is running at 700 kPa, that rapidly fails the acetyl. Um, it'll um, debond it from the underlying layers, it fatigued very quickly, started the pothole, and we had to do major repairs. <coughs> So there's a, there's a little bit of an art to some of these pavement things. So there's index tests and there's performance tests. And the CBR is a bit of an index performance test. It sort of, mm -hmm. you know, falls in between. The triaxial test and the repeat load triaxial test are far more performance based tests. Mm -hmm than index tests. They give you a far better characterisation of the material. You can do them at different moisture contents and different sensitivities and they give you values that you can actually use in your design. Whereas the CBR doesn't. It just says, okay, it's meeting a specification. But all of these tests need to be related to a specific density and a moisture condition. And then you've got to assume that they do actually get those values in construction. There are some typical um, modulus values that you can find in austroids for um, different quality materials. Um, range of um, Poisson's ratio, um, etc. So all of these are in austroids. They're pretty standard values. So high quality crushed rock you usually assign a modulus value of 500. So this would be an example of a circular input. In a circular input, you need to put in the vertical modulus, your horizontal modulus, um, and I think in circular six, he's actually automated this, so you don't actually have to enter the horizontal modulus being half the vertical. Uh, I think that's now automated. Um, Poisson's ratio, and then you determine the shear ratio value F, which is equal to whatever your vertical modulus is, um, multiplied by 1 plus 0 0.35, and that, that's input into Circly. So if you do need to input data into Circly, uh, you'll have to know those particular equations. These are some of the typical CBR values um, that Main Roads uses. Um, so these are sort of the specification limits. So you'll note that you know, you've got gravel, which is 30. Crushed concrete, they're assigning a value of 50 for the CBR. Uh, all the tests I've done about the minimum I've ever got is 150. Um, so. And this is what I mean about the modulus values. If you take um, a typical modulus of asphalt, which in WA runs about between 2,000 and 3,000 MPa, if you've only got 40 millimetres of it, you can develop that full strength of that material. If you've got a full depth asphalt pavement, you've got 200 millimetres of asphalt, you're only realising 210 MPa out of that potential 500. So if you're putting uh, data into a mechanistic analysis and you're running 200 mil of asphalt, then that's the sort of value that you should be putting underneath the asphalt, not the 500. Now, modified granular materials, as I said, they behave as granular materials. And they're modified to correct undesirable properties, but they're not bound and the typical limits that apply are 80 kPa for indirect tensile strength, or 1 MPa, or resilient modulus of 700 to 1500. But then, then you look at all of these great Australian magic lines, as I like to call them, where things are different in every bloody state. Transport and main roads says that something's modified if it's between 1 MPa and 2 MPa, unconfined compressive strength. Vic Roads says it's modified if it's between 1 and 1.5. RMS and Austroads says 1 MPa, and Main Roads West Australia says it's between 0.6 and 1. So 
anyone's guess is pretty good. You know, what, what value is nullified and what's not. I don't know. TMR, uh, uh, Queensland, does a heck of a lot of work on this. And I, apart from their phone bitching, which I do have arguments with them, um, a lot of the stuff that they do produce is pretty bloody good. So um, then they've got what they call bound materials. Um, so TMR has two classifications, a category one, that's between 3.5 and 4.5 MPA, and a category two between 2.5 and 3.5. So they've got different um, levels of binding. Big Rose just says that um, a bound material is between two and two and a half MPA. Sorry, that's, that's wrong. Uh, the bound, should be greater than 2.5 MPA, sorry. So anything greater than 2.5 MPA. No. Bound. No, because that's what they're saying. 1 to 1.5 is modified. <coughs> 2 to 2.5 is bound. Well, that's in the range that um, uh, Queensland Main Roads is, but they're going a lot higher. RMS says anything greater than 1.1 MPA is bound and main roads anything greater than 1.5 but they do have this range where they've got a 7 day test and a 28 day test. None of the others mention that. So main roads has gone a little bit further as far as their um, curing periods go to determine whether something's bound or or, I'm sorry, modified or bound. So, you, as you can see, it's not consistent across Australia. So, for cementation, um, lime does require a clay content to be effective. If you haven't got clay, then don't worry about lime, it's not going to do anything. Portland cement is rapid setting, but it, it is highly likely that you're going to get shrinkage cracking. Um, whether that's a problem or not, it's a political problem more than a structural problem. Um, you can have blended cements, which are the low heat cements. That'll reduce your tendency for cracking, but it does take longer to set up. That's all right. So when you're constructing with cement, um, we do need to be careful with construction methods. Um, there is a theory that what you should do is let the traffic on early to induce a whole heap of micro cracks in it so you don't develop major um, structural cracking. The theory is if you get a lot of micro cracks through, you'll still end up with the friction between the um, the cracks, either side of the cracks, but you don't end up with wide enough cracks so that the aggregate separates and you end up with independent slabs. Curing is essential if you want to complete the hydration process. And that hydration process is interesting because what, um, I don't know whether you've heard of Bob Andrews, he used to be um, Transport South Australia, work hard now. But what he found is that when you manufacture a recycled road base made with footpath concrete, you get much higher strength than you do if you make a road base with structural concrete. And you'd think that was half of that. But when you make a footpath, you never cure it. So the hydration process doesn't complete. And when you put it back into a road base and you start mixing and adding water, the hydration process <coughs> starts again on that unhydrated concrete and actually end up with a stiff material when you deal with structural concrete which is cured and the hydration process is more complete. Um, so if you want to complete that hydration process and get the maximum strength then you've got to cure it. Certainly you don't <coughs> want to have interface problems, so if you're going to stabilise, you really want to do it in one way, not two. 
and in fact I don't even know why they put that into Austrades because I'm not sure why you would go and take off a pavement and stabilise and then come back and do another stabilisation run, it just doesn't make sense. So there are these rules about two layers here but I've never known it to be applied. There are other uh, pozzolanic materials which will set up with time, fly ash, blast burner slag, um, generally these are blended materials, they slow a setting but they can develop very considerable strength. They won't cons uh, suffer with shear failure, or very rarely, if, if you do you've done something remarkably wrong, but they will fatigue and they generally will shrink. <coughs> so again, there's when, when you're dealing with thick layers of um, bound materials, you need to do a mechanistic analysis. There aren't empirical charts available for this. You need to do the circling model modelling. There are some charts in circling, some example charts, but unless what you've got falls within the specific range in Austroids, sorry, Austroids Part Two, then you they're not applicable. So those charts are only for sort of lighter loaded pavements as well? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so 28 day cure is when the modulus is, to, is taken but if you're using slow setting binders you need to have a longer cure time and again the modulus relates very strongly to the constructed density. If you don't get the density then the modulus will be decreased. And there is a fatigue cracking relationship that, that is used. Um, I'm not sure if I've got that here or in the, um, in the pavement design section. But as the modulus increases, so the fatigue will decrease for a given strain level. But obviously as the modulus increases, so the strain will decrease because you've got a stiffer material. And generally the, um, the increase in modulus um, outweighs the thickness. So these are some typical modulus values that you, you, you may get. Uh, lean mix concrete, you'd very rarely go for that unless you're doing a rigid pavement. Um, but base quality, anywhere between 3000 and 8000 MPA with 4 to 4 or 5.5%, 4 to 5% cement. Lower amounts with sub waste quality, 2 to 5000 and sub base quality material, natural gravels, with 4 to 5%. This is what they're saying, 1,500 to 3,000. I would have thought that that sort of quantity of cement you'd probably get higher values. Mm. So these are all input values that you would input into Circly. There is a relationship between the flexural modulus, which is what you want as an input into Circly, and the UCS. So it can be um, 1,000 times the UCS or a hundred times the indirect tensile strength. So if you've got either of these two values which are easily determined, then you can approximate the flexural modulus for input into circling by those equations. All cemented materials will crack. There's no doubt about it. You will get some cracking. The degree of cracking is controlled by these factors here. Um, the bitumen seal is basically to allow the material to cure and, and set slower. Um, you can pre-treat plastic materials with lime before you stabilise, that, that may also help. Or you can blend non-plastic materials to limit the PI between 20 and, um, and the percentage passing the 75 micron to 20%. So, there are some things you can do to control the amount of cracking that you're going to get. You can stop the reflective cracking by placing 175 mm granular 
material over the top or 175 millimetres of asphalt. Who's going to put 175 millimetres of asphalt over a pavement? I'm not real sure. But that, that comes from Big Crows. That's their standard if you're going to use cement stabilisation. Um, small state, big budget, I suppose they can afford it, but we couldn't. Um, you can use a polymer modified seal that will assist a little bit. A geotextile seal will help a lot. Um, they're very good for reflective cracking. Polymer modified asphalt or geogrip um, reinforced asphalts, that's now coming in a, 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 a bit. Um, Geogrid reinforced asphalts that will help with reflective cracking. Um, polymer modified asphalts will help, but it won't completely eliminate it. There is a, a thing about bound pavements is that although you may have a design life for fatigue, once the material is fatigued, it's not had it, it's still a granular material. So you've got a post-secondary life. So you can analyse for the primary life for fatigue and then the secondary life based on a granular pavement design. This is the uh, equation that you input into Circly for determining the um, <coughs> number of allowable repetitions based on the strain. So again, when you run Circly, uh, this is automated, but basically what Circly does is for a different modulus value and throughout the pavements, and for a standard axle, because you only need one, it will determine what the strain is. There's a thing called the minus rule where each, each load puts a certain amount of damage into the pavement and that number of loads is determined by the strain level generated. So if you only knew the strain, you can determine the number of repetitions. Circly does that automatically by just applying this equation to work out how many passes of that tiny little strain it takes before the pavement fails. So here's an example here that you can go through. Um, that just shows you how you, know, you can calculate the um, flexural modulus from the um, UCS and this is a bit useless unless you do run circly but if you do run circly and you found that you had 60 micro strains you put it into this equation here and you can determine how many design repetitions of a standard axle you can have. Asphalt, you all, all know exactly what it is. It's just a mixture of aggregates and bitumen. Um, and <coughs> how it develops its strength, as I said before, is between the particle and the log. <coughs> but there's a couple of important considerations. There's the viscosity of the binder, and there's the cohesion resulting from that binder, and also the adhesion, or the affinity, that the particular aggregate has for the bitumen. So uh, aggregate has a chemical charge and so does bitumen. So some materials bond better with asphalt than others. Diorite is a brilliant. Granite is not so good. But diorite is scarce and we've got plenty of granite. So we use granite for cheapness. But um, diorite seals, there's a number of them around South Perth that are now getting on for nigh on 50 years old and still performing. Uh, you won't get that out of a granite uh, aggregate. People get a bit hung up about grading and often you'll find that um, uh, a consultant will get a report on the asphalt and the asphalt grading might be out and oh shit it's the fan, they want the asphalt removed and replaced and all of that. What they don't realise is that there's dense grade asphalt that follows a maximum density curve and the idea of dense grade asphalt is it requires the lowest bitumen content so it's the cheapest. 
but you can actually fiddle with the, the grating to make different properties with asphalt. So you can start to remove some of the um, aggregate to allow more bitumen to fit in. So you can end up with different properties. And the, the, the particular one that's now very much in fashion is this stone mastic asphalt, where a lot of the uh, intermediate aggregate is removed. So you've got coarse aggregate, filler and bitumen. So you can have a lot of bitumen and a lot of filler which gives you a very long oxidation life and very good fatigue performance. And you may think that it's going to be very um, susceptible to rutting because of the high bitumen content, but it's got stone on stone contact, so all the coarse aggregate is actually touching. So it's actually a very stable mix, but it's a very good mix for um, preventing refractive cracking. It's a very good mix for fatigue performance in high stress areas. It's good if you've got a high curvature base, but it is expensive because there's a lot of bitumen. Open grade asphalt, um, that's a material where it's pretty much a stone mastic asphalt with conventional amounts of bitumen and filler, just enough to hold the aggregate together. And the idea of that stuff is that it allows the water to drain through it. And it's very good on freeways because it stops the, the water spray. It improves skid resistance and things like that. Um, and it also reduces noise for a few years before it starts to clog up. So it's called an environmental asphalt because it's uh, low on noise. You can also modify bitumen with polymers. And those polymers are specific purpose polymers. So you, you may have heard of A15E and A35P and those sort of things. A15E, the E stands for elastomer. So an elastomer will reduce the modulus of the bitumen, make it more flexible and highly fatigue resistant. The P, 35P, stands for plasticizer or plastic and that increases the modulus of the asphalt, makes it stiffer, um, less resistant to, it's more resistant to rutting and shear. Um, it's marginally better on fatigue than a standard asphalt. As I said before, asphalt is viscoelastic so it has all of these properties temperature goes up, the modulus goes down. The rate of loading goes up, the modulus goes up. The resistance to fatigue increases with temperature. The fatigue resistance decreases with increasing modulus. And by definition, for a particular asphalt, its fatigue resistance reduces as the traffic speed goes up because the modulus increases because it's higher speed. So this is an interesting thing that the asphalt is modelled at a given temperature and a given speed. Um, and that's called the weighted mean annual pavement temperature is the temperature that we model it at. And the traffic speed is whatever the 85th percentile speed of the thing is. So that the traffic speed is probably reasonable. The weighted mean annual pavement temperature is probably a bit of a joke. In full depth asphalt pavements, um, I put some temperature gauges in Great Eastern Highway and measured the temperature at various levels in the pavement. And the pavement temperature in the morning is warm on at the bottom and cold on top. As the day goes on, the temperature at the bottom stays reasonably constant, but the temperature at the top gets hotter and hotter. So you've got all these temperature inversions, <coughs> and I really wonder if it's a bit like a bridge slab, where actually the thermal stresses are much higher than what the traffic loading is. And that's possibly why we get top-down cracking in asphalts, deep full depth asphalt pavements, when the theory is that they should crack from the bottom, because that's where the highest stress is. Mm. So we're operating in areas that really I think we're still learning. We're learning a lot. 
anyone who says they're a pavement expert is playing with themselves. I don't regard myself as a pavement expert. <laughs> All I know is that there's strange things and there's ways of making them work, but why they work, who really knows? <laughs> So these are all things that affect the asphalt modulus. How are we going for the slide numbers? Where are we up to? That thing tells me the slide 40 numbers. 40 out of 56. 40 out of 56. Mm. I think we probably should call it a night. Mm -hmm. Everyone remember what we're up to? Yep. 40 out of 56? Yep. Page 10 on these. Thank you. <laughs> so we'll carry on with this next time. It puts us a little bit of the head of schedule anyway. Okay.